Christoph Heusken is the new head of the Munich Security Conference. He has been working in foreign policies for more than 40 years. It's with great pleasure to meet him here in Washington during the Munich Security Conference Springs Summit. Mr. Heusken, great seeing you again. Wonderful to have you. So uh, you are here in the U.S. also to kind of test the waters, especially ahead of these crucial midterm elections. You met uh, with Republican lawmakers. What did you take uh, from that meeting? We were, um, I wouldn't say nervous, but we were very curious. How would the representatives of the different parties now with this challenge that Russia aggression in Ukraine poses, how is their position um, if uh, the midterms go as apparently uh, um, everybody expects and will go to a Republican majority? Would this change the American policy? And um, my impression is very clear that this is a bipartisan position, that um, Democrats and Republicans uh, lawmakers are very firm in the support on a tough policy against Russia, on a strong policy of support to, to Ukraine. So that was um, a really comforting um, information that we received here. Bipartisan is a word we don't hear so often anymore in this really divided country. Uh, that's interesting. but. How do you prepare or can you prepare for the possibility that a Donald Trump is coming back and might use his power to convince Republicans not to put in so much money in the support of Ukraine? We live with the present situation and the present situation uh, from uh, also Republican lawmakers. We uh, talked to a number of uh, Republicans, also those that um, apparently are um, very much in the uh, Trump camp. And um, the message was very clear. This is something where um, Republicans and Democrats are united. Um, I even heard some Republicans saying if Trump had been president, he would have been much tougher on Russia than, uh, um, than President Biden is. So um, I think we are right now in a time where um, in the United States we have on this issue bipartisanship and we have a very good and very close cooperation across the Atlantic. The current uh, uh, president of France, Macron, said, and I quote this year, we should not humiliate uh, Vladimir, um, Vladimir Putin. Um, do you agree with that? Well, you know, first of all, it's it's uh, up to you Ukrainians to say how how they want to direct this um, war. Oh, Putin um, has. Uh, we have built so many bridges to Putin. I remember when we were, you know, trying to get the so-called Petersburg dialogue uh, revitalized. You know, where you have um, uh, discussions with Russia um, between politicians, between representatives of business, civil society, media. We built so many bridges. We have, um, unfortunately, to see that he destroyed all these bridges, that he has violated the UN Charter, he has violated the Charter of Paris, he has violated the, um, you know, the Budapest Memorandum, where actually Russia guaranteed um, territorial sovereignty and integrity to um, Ukraine, and Ukraine gave up uh, nuclear weapons. If you, if a politician um, actually doesn't adhere to any of um, the agreements that uh, he or Russia signed, then um, you wonder how can you work with somebody like this in the future. So um, um, I, um, um, I think um, for me, um, we need Russia. We need Russia to achieve this sustainable development goals, climate and everything. But for me, you cannot seriously talk to a man anymore who has actually violated everything and he is responsible for, um, for war crimes and um, I don't think that, that he can be a, a partner again. Is it possible, is it thinkable that Russia and Putin be integrated again in, in this world uh, order after being kind of uh, completely excluded? So he committed a, a breach of civilization and I don't see how you can sit down with somebody like him who is responsible for the attack on a country, for a violation of the UN Charter. You have seen the pictures, what happens to these thousands of mothers and children, for the thousands of death for the destruction of, of a city like Mariupol, attacks on the city of Odessa. 
I cannot see how you can sit around a table with somebody who is responsible for this. But what does it mean? Do we have to wait for the next president, for the next leader in Russia? As I said, I don't think that you can sit with, with Putin around the table, how Russia is represented. We have the question of the G20, etc. Um, you know, we, um, um, there will be Russian representatives at the United Nations. I just don't think that you can, you, you can seriously sit down with Putin anymore and take him seriously, because when he signs something, you know he will not implement it. You've also been working as the German ambassador to the UN. How can uh, uh, Russia uh, be removed from the UN Security Council? <laughs> there is no way that you can remove Russia from the Security Council. The, um, Russia is a founding member and for Russia, but also for the United States. It was a condition for them to join the UN that they have a veto right. And um, uh, Russia is now extensively using this veto right. But this is a situation that we, that we had also during the, during the Cold War. What for me is very important, and we have seen this, is a certain shift to the General Assembly when uh, Russia uh, cast a veto, when um, the Security Council wanted to condemn Russia, it went to the General Assembly. And in the General Assembly, it was made very clear to the world public that it's only the dictators of, um, of Belarus, of Syria, of Eritrea and North Korea that support um, uh, Putin. So um, also the UN also made it very clear um, um, who is the culprit. But it's also uh, China and the African continent which is not standing so unified uh, behind the Western alliance. Uh, how can you kind of present a viable alternative uh, to China's influence, especially uh, in Africa? Yes, I think sometimes we commit the mistake of uh, presenting this conflict that we are um, witnessing now in Ukraine, the Russian aggression that we, um, or it is presented as kind of a prolongation of the East-West conflict. And, and this is not what it is. What we are witnessing is uh, the blatant violation of the UN Charter of International Law, of the international rules-based order. And I think this has to be our message. This has to be our message also um, towards African countries, Latin American countries. This is not about East-West. This is about um, the, the, the rules that are enshrined in the UN Charter and we have to work together um, worldwide to preserve um, this um, basis for our, um, for our civilization. But having that said, I mean, the support from, again, China, India isn't as it probably, in your opinion, should be in the UN. Well, you know, we have these great pl power games and um, we see that um, China and India are um, abstaining and uh, this is something where I think we have to work uh, hard on and we have to also uh, make it very clear to these countries that, um, you know, what is at stake here is um, the UN Charter. Is there, uh, do we want to follow uh, international rules or don't we want to do it? So I think we have to, we have to work very hard and this is is also something that um, we have to do from uh, from Germany, from European countries. Sometimes you hear the argument with the United States in the lead that, well, these are double standards. You know, where was the international community when the U.S. Um, uh, in the second uh, Iraq war invaded um, Iraq also without any um, basis and, and, and no um, international law as justification. So this is what we have to overcome. This is an important role also for us um, Europeans, for a country like like Germany that is also has always based its policy on the on international law and that we also step up to the plate. There's a lot of applause for the current Zeitenwende as our Chancellor uh, Scholz said but there is also a lot of uh, criticism uh, of Germany's long-standing Russia policies. Uh, was Angela Merkel naive? Well um, we have um, um, talked to a lot of colleagues here from all over the world and uh, 
Um, everybody tells us that um, they were surprised what uh, Russia did, that uh, Russia was actually now Putin was um, um, became as aggressive as he as he did. Um, you know, we were at the Munich Security Conference um, in February, um, where the international community was very united. I mean, we were thinking that Putin must be impressed by, by this and he will not dare to enter Ukraine because it will end badly for him. He went in there anyway and it's ending very badly for him. So um, I think one, one needs to take into consideration also the, the way to which in which um, Putin um, during COVID has been, you know, uh, secluded from public, op public opinion, public wider European public opinion, and he has started to believe its own own propaganda. And this is very difficult then to, to cope with. Basically, I think the the idea that we had since the end of um, the Second World War after, um, you know, in the name of Germany, 27 million Soviets were killed, I think, for us to try and get into a better relationship with um, uh, with uh, Russia uh, to build bridges, I think, was the right, right policy. We just have to realize that um, Russia today um, is ready to destroy all these bridges that we have been trying to build. But there were warning voices. I had the honor to interview George W. Bush half a year ago or so, and we talked about Angela Merkel and her legacy. And as much as he praised her, um, he said that he, and that was before the war in Ukraine, that he warned uh, uh, Angela Merkel and her administration about the dependency from Russia when it comes to German energy supply. Don't you think the German administrations uh, kind of again were naive or underestimating uh, Vladimir Putin. I think that what what we uh, um, what I have been really proposing during for a long time is that we have something like a national security council where you deal with these questions, you know, in in a context. Um, I think we have when we were when the, the when the questions were answered, where do we get our energy from? After we said we don't um, we don't want to prolong nuclear energy. When we said we don't want coal, we looked around and said, well, where is the cheapest gas? and this was from Russia, so we went that way. I think uh, what we would have been necessary, and I think what I really think we urgently need, is a kind of a National Security Council where all these questions, you know, um, defense, and um, but also energy security, um, you know, domestic security, terrorism, um, this all comes together and these questions are dealt with also not only from a point of view where do we get our um, you know, cheapest uh, um, energy from, but what does this mean uh, with regard to strategic um, dependence? We have this discussion now you know, a lot on, on China, you know, how much do we depend on China? And I think there is also a question, it's also a question of security, how much um, do we uh, make us dependent on, on China? While I'm um, not in favor of breaking ties with China, but there has to be a balance and we have to actually diversify um, um, also with regard to China. You've been in foreign policy for 40 years. Um, when you look backwards, was there a moment in hindsight, obviously, when you think, wow, that could have been a warning when it comes to Putin? Well, we have seen uh, Putin, how he, how he behaved, and um, when you go back at the last um, aggression of Putin, 2014-15, it was actually Chancellor Merkel together with um, François Hollande, who was at the uh, front line and, and you know, in negotiations stopped the Russian um, advance. They agreed on the Minsk agreement and, and they got uh, Russia at a table. So I think that was the right decision. Again, what um, happened then, we, we tried really to get into negotiations to see how can we resolve this with peaceful means. At some stage, Putin decided, no, he wants to, to uh, go on another track. And this is what, 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 what happened then um, um, on the 24th of February. Germany, as you just said, was once really seen as a bridge builder to Moscow. Who could fill in this role moving forward? 
I think right now it's very difficult to fill in. We have many Russians who have fled Russia and they come to Germany. Um, I think these people who are educated people, who are people who are desperate when they see what is happening there, I think there are so many also in other countries, Russians, I think these will be the partners in the, in the future uh, to build a new Russia. Thank you very much and I'm looking forward to keep this conversation going. Yes, thank you very much for having me. Thank you.